If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 2. Last week we covered chapter 1. And uh, it happened, uh, you know, we, we didn't read all those names there is how we got through a whole chapter. Uh, most of them are divided up, it looks like, where there's at least uh, two sermons out of each chapter. But we're going to walk all the way through the, uh, the book of Matthew. And uh, we are excited about uh, just reading the book and studying it. And uh, Jesus is just lifted up. And the Sermon on the Mound, uh, the Beatitudes... Uh, just some great uh, scripture that we will be going through, and we praise the Lord for that. And if you notice the background to some of our music, it was Christmas, all right? Because, uh, I, you know, this is kind of a Christmas uh, sermon, and wise men still seek Him. And that's the <clears throat> what we'd like to share with you this morning. If you have a bulletin and want to follow along with us, let me give you the outline. Number one, God's divine guidance. All right? God is not playing hide and seek with you, folks. He wants you to follow the instructions. And the way we do that is by His holy word. God's divine guidance. Number two, God's divine protection. Do you realize nothing happens to you that surprises God? He is with us. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. And the third one, <clears throat> wise men's true worship. See, there's a difference between attending church and worshiping at church. Anybody can sit in a chair. <laughs> that is not hard at all. But true church, true, uh, you know, uh, an encounter with God comes through worship. And folks, we have not come here to entertain you this day. We have come to share the message of Christ in song, to share the Word of God. And hopefully, we give you some spiritual food that you can grow with. And so it's so important that we truly worship God when we come to church. In our text today, we see three reactions to the birth of Jesus Christ. First, we see Herod, who was hostile to his birth. He wanted to be king of the Jews and would try to kill baby Jesus. The second response uh, to Jesus' birth was the chief priests who were indifferent to Jesus. And here's what's crazy to me. Baby Jesus was only five miles from them but they refuse to see him or acknowledge his birth or kingship. Even after Jesus had grown up and in his ministry and doing the miracles, they would not say Jesus Christ is Lord. They will not say he, what, he is the Messiah. Then the third response was from the wise men. They searched for, found baby Jesus, worshiped him, and gave him gifts. My prayer today is that you will see Jesus for who he is and what he has done for you and truly worship him. And by the way, Matthew 2 reveals four locations uh, which we see in the Old Testament prophecy scripture of Jesus' birth and early life come true. The four locations are Bethlehem, Egypt, Ramah, and Nazareth. So let's look starting in uh, chapter 2, verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and we covered that last week, we know how important the, uh, the birth of Christ is. It is the single most important thing in history that ever was. And it says, of Judea in the days of Herod the king. Behold, wise men from the east uh, uh, came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. And we see the wise men, and uh, many wanted to know who these people were because uh, it wasn't, you, you know, you kind of get... <clears throat> from manger scenes and things, that there were just three wise men. And there was three. 
But all the indications that you see here is that there were a lot of people that came with them. They traveled. It could have been up to six months uh, to find this baby Jesus. And they were, they were uh, wise men which interpreted dreams. Uh, they dealt with astronomy and astrologers. Uh, they were scholars. They were well-educated. And being kings, wise men, uh, and, and being royalty, they were also wealthy. So when you saw a, a group of people like that who were Gentiles come to Bethlehem, I am telling you, they showed out. There was no doubt uh, that they were different from everyone else there. And here it says they came from the east, which I believe is Babylon uh, in the Orient, and they came to Jerusalem, and they were looking. And my question is, how did they know Jesus was going to be born? Well, one is God obviously told him that, but I believe also uh, there's, there's ways that God gets a hold of us. Right now, he does it through the Holy Spirit, okay? The Holy Spirit tells us where we should go, what we should do, what we, what we should say. So we have the Holy Spirit, which we received in Acts chapter 2. And here it is saying that these these guys, they, they had that feeling, they had that urge, they had that knowing something is going on, and they listened to God, and they followed the instructions that God had given them. Hold your finger there and go to Exodus with me. Exodus 13. Exodus 13, verse 17. We are talking about uh, the, the children of Israel just leaving Egypt. And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although it was near. For God said, lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. Folks, God's way is better than our way. And when he gives us directions, we need to follow them. We don't need to help him adjust any plans. And it looked logically like this doesn't make sense. But I am telling you, God is trying to keep us from roadblocks and things uh, that are not of God. So God led the people around by the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And we know one reason uh, that he did that uh, was because he was going to destroy Pharaoh and, and his armies. And the children of Israel went up in orderly uh, ranks out of the land of Egypt. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, and he had placed the children of Israel under solemn oath, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here with you. So they took their journey from Sethkoth and encamped in Etham, the edge of the wilderness. And here's what I wanted you to see. And the Lord went before them day it, by day in a pillar of cloud, to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. So even God's chosen people early in the Old Testament, God had a way of connecting with them, and it was, it was a pillar of fire uh, by night and a, a cloud in the daytime. In verse 22, and he did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of cloud by night, from before the people. So God has a way of communicating to us, and He does it through His Word today. He does it through prayer today. And so we, when we hear the instructions of God, folks, we need, and, and it doesn't matter about the majority. Do you realize the majority, majority can be wrong? When they got to Kadesh Barnea, Ten of them says, no way, we've been there, we can't do this. But two said, hey, we need to do what God says. And they disobeyed God and spent 40 years in the wilderness. So when we hear from God, we need to obey. Well, how did, how did these wise men know 
where they were going and what this was about. And obviously it was the Holy Spirit. But go with me to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel 2, I want you to see this. Then, then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face, prostrate before Daniel, and commanded that they should present an offering and incense to him. What had happened? He had all these wise men and all these folks in his kingdom, and nobody could interpret their dream. That was what some of them were supposed to do. But Daniel came along and interpreted the dream, and folks, God allowed him to do it. God gave him the interpretation the king answered Daniel and said, Truly, your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and the revealer, revealer of secrets. I mean, even he, we're talking about a pagan king that didn't truly know God, realized that there was something different about Daniel. And folks, that's what we are supposed to be. We are supposed to be light in a dark generation. And it says, since you could not reveal this secret, then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many, uh, many great gifts, and he made him ruler over the whole providence of Babylon and the chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. Isn't that neat how God does these things? And again, this is just my opinion. This is possibly one way these wise men knew. And we're talking about generations back, this took place. But they kept passing it along and passing it along. They didn't have written copies of the Word of God. So you had to pass these things along. And I believe that was the possibility uh, with these wise men. So we see God's divine guidance. Number two, back in our Scripture, look at verse 3. And when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. Why was he troubled? Because he was supposed to be king of the Jews, which really didn't make any sense because he was not a Jew. He was a Gentile. He was one, uh, you know, by birth, Edomites. Okay? And so the reason he was called king of the Jews because he married a Jew. And by the way, <laughs> He was married nine times that we know of. So let me help you here. <laughs> Herod had issues. <laughs> okay, he had issues. Not only those two things, but he had one of his wives killed and her sons and uh, his mother-in-law killed. Why? Because he thought that they might uh, want to take over the kingdom. And so he was paranoid. He had just crazy stuff in his head. And, and here he was troubled. Why? Because he thought, somebody is going to dethrone me. Somebody wants to take my place. And the Bible says, and all Jerusalem with him. Why were they troubled? Because we didn't know who these folks were. We didn't know where they came from. How did they have? They looked rich on top of everything else. And so they were all troubled. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So someone was telling him, listen, this may be a prophecy. And do you realize what I said earlier? There were over 300 Old Testament prophecies of Jesus' birth, Jesus coming to earth. And it says, verse 5, so they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus is it written by the prophets. And Micah chapter 5, verse 2 speaks of that. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall, become a, shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So we knew in what he was talking about that Jesus was, was going to rule over uh, Israel. The lineage, we said last week, of King David. Then verse 7, Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men. Notice the word secretly. Why do you have secret meetings? Because you don't want anybody else to know about it. He was paranoid. All right, he, he was desperate. 
Okay, he has proved uh, that he was a murderer and a liar. And it says, called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring him back, uh, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. Did Herod really want to worship uh, Jesus? No, folks. He lied. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Okay? He was wanting to kill baby Jesus. That tells you how deranged his mind is. It tells you how evil his mind was. And so he was, Jesus was a threat. And he was going to uh, try to talk these wise men in. You go find them and you let me know where they are. Well, I don't know if you've thought about this before, but I have several times. Was the star being able to, was it able to be seen by everyone? Think about that. I believe when it was over the manger, they could not see it. Just the wise men could see it. And you ask me, Mike, why do you say that? Because if there was a star there, everybody in town would have been looking and finding out. And if everybody in town knew, guess who's going to know? Folks, I am telling you, it was God's divine protection. He is with us every day. He is is our rock. He is our shelter. He is our hiding place. And I'm telling you, uh, you know, he, he was taking care of baby Jesus. Look at uh, Psalm 27 with me, if you would. Psalm 27. Psalm 27. This is a Psalm of David. And this is so encouraging, folks. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? We should not fear anyone. Nobody, folks. God is stronger than any power here on earth. The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? And the problem is, even the verse, one of my favorite verses, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What we do first is we try to do everything ourselves. And then when it doesn't work out or we're in a jam, we start praying. Can I suggest that you start praying first? Can I suggest that you quit praying long enough to hear the answer from God? Folks, people give up on situations too quick because we're impatient. If God doesn't answer that prayer right away, we say it wasn't the will of God. If he doesn't answer it right away, we look for other ways to do it. And folks, God wants to be so in tune with you and you with him that you know what he's thinking, that you know in your heart of hearts, this is what I need to do. And people make it hard. Uh, you know, a question I get asked all t- the time, how, you know, how can you know the will of God in your life? Well, you better be praying. You better be reading your Bible. You better be asking for wisdom. What is the wisdom book? Proverbs. Folks, God speaks through his word. Verse 2, And when the wicked came up against me to eat my flesh... My enemies and foes, they stumbled and they fell. Though an army may camp against me. Ask Elijah about that army that came around. And his servant looked around and said, oh man, we're dead. (laughs) We are dead. And Elijah comes out of his tent and says, oh, I'm not worried about this. And folks, God blinded the enemy. Blinded them. Folks, I am telling you, God is powerful. His word is true. There's no such thing as an impossible situation. 
Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise up against me, in this I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. What does God call, what does God call your body? A temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, folks, the answer's inside of us. It's inside of us. We have the Holy Spirit to help us. And folks, we need to turn to God in all situations of life before things fall apart. To be, to all the days of our life, to behold beauty uh, of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. For in the time of trouble, He shall hide me in His pavilion and in the secret place of His tabernacle. Folks, in the Old Testament, it was the Shekinah glory of God that was uh, between the mercy seat. It was in the Holy of Holies. But now we are the temple of God. We can go to God anytime we choose. And folks, we need to spend more time with God. And He shall hide me, and He shall set me high upon a rock. So we see God's divine guidance. We see God's divine protection. And let's let's see the last thing, the wise men's true worship. And when they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Folks, they were new in town. They didn't know street addresses. They didn't know anything about the town. But God led them straight to baby Jesus with this star. And they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. Folks, you would be rejoicing too if you just traveled six months looking for a person. You would rejoice too knowing who that person was. You would rejoice too knowing that God in heaven showed them the way. Verse 11, and when they had come into the house, and, and you have to realize, you know, most nativity scenes, it has the shepherds, you know, at the stable, and it has the, 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 the wise men. But folks, from all that I have read and studied, it was probably six months to a year after Jesus was born is why they used the word house here. And they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Oh, folks, I cannot wait for the day. I believe with all my heart, the rapture of the church is the next thing on God's prophetic calendar. I cannot wait till we walk through the pearly gates of heaven. I believe with all my heart, the first thing I will do, I will do the same thing that they did, the Magi did. They worshiped God. They fell down and worshiped Him. Oh, folks, we haven't seen anything like heaven. There is nothing perfect here on earth. We can find temporary happiness, and we can even find joy in our lives. But when they were in the presence of God, baby Jesus, everything changed. Now, folks, you can encounter God every day of your life. You can experience true worship every day of your life. It was just like yesterday. We were riding motorcycles, and I'm just going, I'm leading, I'm just going down the road, and I hear a song that I love. And I'm just singing, singing away. And all at once, I make a left turn when we should have made a right one. (laughs) We go down a little ways, and it was a dirt road. Okay? Folks, you can worship God anywhere. Anywhere. And he will lead you. Now, we did stop, get on the phone, and find out where I messed up. All right? But my point is, you can worship all day long if you choose. See, worship is more than an attitude. It is a spirit, the spirit of worship. 
And that's what they did. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented them gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Of course, we all know that gold was, it's still worth a lot of money. So that's one of the ways that we knew these wise men were well off. Frankincense was an incense that they used, uh, it or, you know, when, when kings and, you know, it, for, for folks, it's, it's almost like a perfume. And it is very, very expensive. And then myrrh, which is, again, not near as expensive, but they, uh, they would anoint dead bodies when they, you know, did things for, for getting them ready for burial. They would use the myrrh. And then I have to ask myself, why these gifts? I believe the reason they were these expensive gifts so that they could fund them, so that they would have money when they needed to go to Egypt to have the money to do that. And folks, I am telling you, do you know the best gift that you can give God? The best gift you can give God is your life. It's your life. See, God's not looking for part-time Christians. He's looking for full-time Christians. God wants us so in tune with Him that when we feel the presence of the Holy Spirit come across us, we will obey what He tells us to do. The number one reason people do not witness to others is fear. Do you know where fear comes from? Our Bible says fear comes from Satan. Folks, you can't mess it up if the Holy Spirit is inside of you and God told you, you need to go talk to that person. That's what he's talking about. We need, we need to worship God here in this place. And I love our worship services. But it's made to get us fired up so that we can go out and do the work of God. The number one thing a church, the number one thing a church needs in their life is evangelism. Jesus came to save the lost. And we need to tell everyone about Jesus. Do you think these wise men just kept it to themselves? I don't think so, folks. Now look at verse 12. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. There's another, another deal. God speaking to them. Hey, don't go back that way. Don't even talk to King Herod. You take the long way home. And I am telling you, you talk about a journey. Can you imagine the first conversation the night that they left? Just sitting around a campfire just thinking, that was crazy. That was great. Well, folks. I cannot wait to get to heaven. Psalm 145, Psalm 145, and I close. Psalm 145, I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Oh, folks, you can have church every day of your life. Spend time in the Word. Spend time in prayer. Listen to Christian music. Folks, I'm just telling you my truck, and when I'm on my motorcycle, I've got a headphones. When I wake up early in the morning, you know, sometimes I wake up at 4.30, and I'm thinking, Lord, what are we doing here? And then I always put my headphones on, and I listen, because I'm just telling you, Christian music just soothes my soul. Every day I will bless your name. Do you do that? Every day are you blessing God? Every day are you thanking God? You're breathing. You got up today. You could drive to church today. There's so many things that we take for granted, folks. Every day I will bless you and praise your name. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. Oh, folks, wise men still seek him. 
folks, we get, we get distracted. Satan throws these darts and these arrows at us. Satan distracts us with problems and, and hurts and feelings. But folks, we have to get to where we put those out of our mind and we truly worship God for who He is. If you're here today and don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, folks, I am telling you, it is the greatest decision you'll ever make in your life. God seeks you. God wants you to go to heaven. But it's up to you, folks. He's not going to make you go. And my prayer is, if there's one here today that doesn't know you, today would be their day of salvation. And Christian, do you worship just on Sundays? Folks, we need to worship every day of our lives. We need that worship to spill over to boldness, to sharing the gospel and inviting people. Folks, we have the greatest thing known to mankind. It's not an invention. It is Jesus Christ. And we need to share that with others. Father, thank you for this day. And God, I thank you for the example of wise men. And God, I pray that everyone here, everyone here would want to be a wise man and woman. God, there have to be changes. We can't just do what we we're doing and expect things to change. So God, I pray that you would just speak to hearts today. There may be Christians here that need to rededicate their life. They may need to recommit their decision, recommit their life to you. They need to read the Bible every day. They need to pray every day, and they need to worship every day. God, they're just down. They're just looking at all the negative things. God, I pray they would look towards you. God, there is that peace that passes all understanding, and it is found in you. And God, I pray for others. Maybe they need to follow the Lord in baptism, or maybe they want to join the church. You're speaking to them today. And God, I just pray if they, if they feel uh, like you are telling them to do that, that they would have the courage to come. God, this is your church. This is your time. So God, I pray you would bless it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?